Father, we thank you again for hearing our prayers. Thank you, Lord, that you again are willing and want to answer, and you are going to answer. And so, Father, we thank you for everything that you have given us so far. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. And, Father, your word says that you honor your word above everything else. And so, Father, we pray that God the Holy Spirit will have his way in the delivery of your word, in the hearing of your word, in the receiving of your word, and then the applying of your word today. Father, as we get into the topic of sharing the gospel, I come alongside of all of us and ask that God, the Holy Spirit, would minister to us however he'd like to today about sharing the gospel. I pray that, Lord, as he ministers um, through me this morning, that he would just use me, that uh, the type of spirit he brings to it would be here. And um, if it's a gentle, a quiet, or a thundering, whatever he would like to do today, we pray that he would be free to do that. So, Lord, grant us all to hear up under your word with a view to allow you to use it to change our thinking and transform our lives. So thank you again for everything that you're going to do in advance. And we give you all the glory and the praise. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, our church, along with a lot of other churches, will be focusing on sharing the gospel with as many people possible here in the Denver area, including the suburbs, during the next four months. This morning's sermon comes as a challenge for some of us, and maybe for some of us it's just a reminder about sharing the gospel, or what the Bible calls the good news, about Jesus Christ. The first thing that I want to bring to our attention this morning is the mindset of our culture, or in other words, how our, our culture thinks, and you know this already, so I'll just be confirming some things that you already know. The mindset of our culture is one that is without God. The mindset of our culture is a mindset that's without excuse. The mindset of our culture is one that is also without hope. Now let's read Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 3 together as soon as I can get over there. And uh, we're going to read that together. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. One moment. Okay, let's read this together out loud. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Ephesians chapter 2 brings a whole lot to the table, okay? It brings a whole lot to the table, but one of the things the beginning of the chapter brings to the table, it brings your history, it brings my history, provided that I am a Christian, that I'm saved, that I'm a believer at this point. It looks back and it says, this is where you were before you got saved, okay? And so it's talking about our history. And so as we learn from this history lesson, we learn that each one of us, before we came to know God personally, um, we were a certain way. And so as we get into this, the first thing I want to remind you of is when you got saved, you did come to know God personally. You came to know the truth, okay? You came to know the truth. You came to know the reality, and you experienced God's amazing grace, even if you don't know it. You experienced it the day you got saved. You experienced God's favor the day you got saved, even if you don't know it. The day you got saved, you experienced God's power. Man does not know how much power it took to get us out of the sewer spiritually that we were living in. So you came in touch with God's power as well. And the main thing, most of all, you came in touch with God's love. It's all motivated by his love. So all of us that were a part of the culture and everyone who is in the culture now that is apart from Christ, we're separated from God by nature and by choice. By nature and by choice. Why? Because we are sinners by nature and by choice. We love us some sin. Amen? We love us some me. And if, it if that doesn't get it for you, we love some operating independently of God. That's sin operating independently of God. We love that. Amen. Even when we're the most moral people in our city, we love some operating independently from God and that sin. Amen. And so we love that. We were separated from God. Okay. And that separation from God, it reveals itself. It shows up. How does it show up? In our rebellion against God and our disobedience. Our rebellion and our disobedience uh, against God. We will never really hit the target. You know, we just don't hit the target. We either go too far 
That's what the Bible means by trespassing. You're going too far. You're somewhere you're not supposed to be. Or we sin, and what sin means is we miss the mark. We never get where we're supposed to be, okay? And so that's what this book here, this chapter, Ephesians chapter 2, is talking about here. We never hit the target. We either go too far or not far enough. We're either somewhere we should not be, we're somewhere we should not be, or we're not where we should be. We're not where we should be, okay? And that's how this thing called sin shows up. Here's another one for us. When we're part of the culture, the Bible's teaching this in Ephesians chapter 2, we knowingly or unknowingly, this is what we're doing, we major on something. And what we major on is listening to the enemy of God. Listening to the enemy of God and anyone that the enemy of God will use to get us to accomplish his goal. And his goal is, I don't care how famous you are, how rich you are, how moral you are, how much money you have. I don't care if you're an American, you're an African, I don't care where you're from. All I want from you, I'll even give you other things. But here's what I want from you. Just live your life leaving God out. Leaving God. God out. So when we're unsaved, we major on listening to Satan and listening to those he would use to leave God out, leave out the Most High God. This attitude is called sin, the noun. Sin, the noun. But it shows up in sins, the verb, the actions that we take. It's sin, the noun. An attitude toward God that leaves him out. This is the mindset of the culture. This is a mindset. Those people who need the Lord, God's word say, it says, are without God. They are without God, okay? And so as we go there, the mindset is they're without God, but even though that's the culture's mindset, the Bible says something very, very serious about that, that God says, as we look down from heaven, the culture has no excuse. The culture has no excuse. We're going to look now at Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. And I will turn there, and you probably already have it on the screen. Romans chapter 1, we're looking at verses 18 through 23. As we get into Romans chapter 1, you need to remember this now. The first three chapters of Romans chapter 1 are trying to create an argument. Paul's trying to convince his readers of something. And here's what Paul is trying to convince his readers of in the first three chapters. You have a need, sir. You have a need, madam, for the righteousness of God. You need God's righteousness. And he says, I have to show you that you're really not righteous in and of yourself, okay? And so that's what he's doing there. So our culture, God says, is without excuse. I'm going to read Romans chapter um, 1, verses 18 through 23. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because... That which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Our Bibles teach that God is right and he's just in revealing his wrath. And what is he revealing it toward? Ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And he says, this is why, because mankind has no excuse. Then God says, we know about him because he's built something into us that tells us about him. So there's no one that says, oh, no, I don't know. We, we have all these, what about somebody over there and all that. God says, I put something in you that tells you about me, okay? Something on the inside lets you know about me. And then he goes on and he says, you know what? I even put things in creation that when you look out, and you see that sunset. You look into those Rocky Mountains. You're looking just in the sky. It tells you something about me. There's got to be a God somewhere. Yeah. 
it tells you something about me. But instead of drawing closer to him, instead of saying, I wonder how can I get to know this God? Instead of saying, hey, um, is there a way we can get a relationship? We don't do that. You know, we don't seek to know him. We don't seek to honor him. We don't even thank him for anything. We're talking about the culture. We're talking about who we are before we get saved. We're talking about these people who need the Lord, okay? And so they're people who don't honor God. They're people who are not grateful to God as well, never thanking for anything. And then we go the next step. We start a bunch of speculations, okay? We say, well, what if? What if God is this? We start that type of thing. Well, I guess maybe God is like this. And then here's a new word, a phrase I, I come up with. We come up with a bunch of I supposes, I supposes, I suppose he's like this. Maybe he's like that. And then that continues to go on and we keep going downward. Instead of seeking this guy, we're trying to excuse him away. We're trying to make him disappear on the inside. And so we keep going down and then what we try to do is we replace God. We're gonna find somebody to replace God. Some of us start with ourselves, I am God. I'm my own God. I have the final say in my life. I am God. So some of us go there, and then some of us start to worship other things and other people, okay? We look for a substitute. We try to replace God. We get a substitute, and man has gotten so bad that he even makes images, and he says, that's your God. Here, O Israel, the golden calf, the God who brought you out of Egypt. Okay, and we do that today. The God of the almighty dollar that brought me out of Egypt. Amen? Or a certain person. So we do these things and we make replacements and substitutes of God. This is the culture that we live in. This is who you and I were before we got saved. And so he's arguing in these first three chapters, you got to listen to what God says about you before you get saved. So you'll be convinced, I need God's righteousness because I'm not righteous. And so that's what he's doing. He's trying to convince. Then we exchange the truth for lies. Amen, somebody. Yes, the culture gotten really good about that recently. We're calling things wrong, right, and calling right, wrong. And we are talking about things that are okay and they need to be fought for and they're your right. Things that people would be going, oh my God, years ago. You don't really mean to say that. That's where we are. And what is even more sad is that we're bringing these things into the church and we're justifying them and saying this is what God's word says as well. Amen? And so we're justifying things. These replacements, these substitutes, we exchange the truth for lies. And then we start to worship what God has created instead of him as the creator. Amen. This is why people need the Lord. Amen. Amen? This is why we need the Lord. This is why you and I needed the Lord before we got saved, if you're saved here today. Our culture, again, is without God. Our culture, again, is without excuse. Without an intervention from God, our culture is without hope. Without an intervention from God, our culture is without hope. Do you know today, have you forgotten today, that left to yourself, Ron Fox left to himself, he will naturally run away from God. He will run away from God. The Bible says in this very same book, we are at enmity or hatred toward God. This is the picture of mankind. This is the picture of the culture. This is the picture of people who need the Lord, who need you to bring the gospel to them. Somebody brought the gospel to you. People need the Lord. They need the Lord. This is the picture. The culture seeks to leave God out. The culture seeks to substitute for God. The culture seeks to raise up other gods in his place. And then this book of Romans chapter 1 says this. And then we look at people doing it and we celebrate them and we encourage them to keep doing what they're doing. Amen. You got a right, honey. Keep doing what you're doing. So that's where we are. Oh, man, Paul's saying, don't you know you need God's righteousness? Don't you know people need the Lord? If we don't have God's intervention, we're going to stay stuck here. But God, in his grace. In his mercy, in his love, he does not want us to stay there. He does not want us to stay there because of sin. 
He doesn't want us to stay there. We're there because of sin, which results in sinning. Amen? That's why we're there. But God says, no, I don't want you to stay there. Not on my watch. Not on my watch, Yahweh is saying. Not on my watch. And through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, God brought a solution to our problem. Part of God's solution is God the Holy Spirit. Part of God's solution is God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes after you in that unsaved state to draw you into relationship with God. Okay? Without that, um, you know what? Without Him, we have, would have nothing to do with God. So I'm going to read something now, you guys, when we do these Sunday school lessons and we do these Wednesday night things, we're not necessarily checking each other's notes or anything like that, but we are going to talk about something that we talked about a little bit um, in Sunday school this morning. I'm going over to John 16, verses 17 through 11, and we have to be reminded that part of God's solution is he sent his spirit, and this is what the spirit does, as was emphasized this morning, in the heart of unbelievers, okay? John 16, 17 through 11 here's what the Bible says but I tell you the truth it is to your advantage that I go away for if I do not go away the helper will not come to you but if I go I will send him to you and he he when he comes he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me and concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. Yeah. As was already stated in Sunday school, God the Holy Spirit convicts the world, the culture, the unbeliever, the unsaved about sin, righteousness, and judgment. And this is what we gotta get. Do you, did you hear what I just said? God the Holy Spirit uses um, this, I mean, his ministry is to convict the world, unbelievers, unsaved people, those people who need the Lord about sin, righteousness, and judgment. But folks, please hear this and please grab a hold of this. But did somebody forget to give us the rest of the memo that God, the Holy Spirit, uses people to do that? He uses people. And that's why people need the Lord and people need to, who know the Lord, need to be sharing the Lord with those people who need the Lord. Amen. He uses people. Now this word convict here is really important and our Sunday school teacher brought out some aspects of it and I'm going to bring something else out to you about this and this is a quote from Charles Ryrie. I want to quote it. It says, to convict means to set forth the truth of the gospel in a clear light so that men are able to accept or reject it intelligently. Amen. Conviction is God the Holy Spirit comes to you and however he's dealing with you. But one of the things he does is he uses people to give you a word that makes sense, that's lined up, that he can use where you stand at the end and say, hmm, I got it, I understand it, now what am I going to do? And the thing that we have to choose, two choices, reject it or accept it. That's what it means when God the Holy Spirit comes to convict an unbeliever of sin. You get what I used to call a clear presentation of the gospel. And then you are a person who's standing there in a spiritual crisis because you got to do something with Jesus. Right. You can't be neutral. You've got to do something with the gospel. You can't just say, hmm, I don't know. You can't do that. You're forced. I'm forced to make a decision. He uses people. So this is very important. God said, not on my watch. And so after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, he sends the Spirit, and he uses the Holy Spirit to draw us, okay? Without that, we are really in a mess, okay? He's seeking to get us to deal with who we are, what we are, how we got there. He's seeking to ask us to really deal with what are you going to do with God? That's what the Holy Spirit is talking about. And specifically, what are you going to do with the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's what God the Holy Spirit does. So we're talking about the culture. They're without God. Okay? They are without excuse. And but for God, they are without hope until God the Holy Spirit goes to work. Not on my watch, God says. And so God, who does all things well, he sent his son, he sends his spirit on a rescue mission, and what he uses is his people presenting the gospel. Presenting the gospel. 
Okay, so to get the gospel, um, you got to know about it. You got to know about the God of, gospel. Excuse me. You got to embrace it. You got to know what it's all about. So as we move on now, there are at least three methods of sharing the gospel, and there are three methods of receiving the gospel. Okay, we're going to go with these words today: non-relational, relational, and proclamational. Non-relational, relational, and proclamational. They may sound a little funny, but you know all of them already, trust me. Let's go with non-relational. This is where the gospel is in print. Okay, it's in print through tracts. It might be in print through uh, different methods. There's the social media. It's something that you can read. You might even be able to read the gospel on a billboard for all I know. But it's where the gospel is put in print. It's the media. You see it and you hear it. This is non-relational. What we're talking about is that you've got to grab a hold of this and we have to be reminded. I have to be reminded all the time. This is God's word and this word is living. Okay, Hebrews 4.12, it's living, it's active, it goes down real deep, gets past our rationalization, goes all the way deep down where our soul and spirit are to the depth of our being. This is God's word, and God's word is what he uses and what he honors. And so as we get into this, we have to understand it doesn't matter if God's word is in leather or if it's in a track, you're hanging on somebody's door. It is still God's word, and you are hanging something living on this person's door. Amen? And if they, they don't need you to be there for God the Holy Spirit to say, Sin, righteousness, and judgment, brother and sister, you ready to deal? Because they can lock their doors, they can put their bars up, they don't have to answer the door. But when they're in there all alone, God the Holy Spirit is hunting. God the Holy Spirit is using the word. And so you don't always have to have a deep relationship with someone to present the gospel. Tracks are a beautiful way to do that. You can give a track to the person who served your meal with your tip. You can give a track to that uh, repairman that comes into your house. You can give a track to anybody. I was talking to a man this weekend who happened to be in my block and he was going through something with his son. It was very tragic. It was a very sad situation. And he's on his way to go visit his son. And so we're talking about it. What could I do? I, if we didn't have time, he's on his way to go visit his son. I had tracks. We got tracks. Hey, let me give you this track. Maybe this will help you come into relationship with Christ. I prayed with the man. I got tracks. Say, give these to your son when you get there. Maybe something will happen there. This man, I don't know if this man is a believer or not. I don't think he was. He tells me a story. He said, maybe something like that works. Because I had a friend who had brain cancer. And at the last second, he asked the doctors to check. And all his cancer was gone in the street. Gone. He said, people prayed. He prayed. He said, maybe that thing works. I said, yeah, maybe it does. <laughs> so he went on his way with the tracks. And then before he left, he's trying to help his son. He said, maybe I can get my son to read this. Maybe this will help. That's the word of God. It's living. He really doesn't need us if he has the word of God because God, the Holy Spirit, is going to take that word and transform a life if we allow it. Amen. And so he went on his way. And so he's, he went on over there and I didn't, I didn't, I don't know what else happened, but you can do that. You can't always spend the whole day with everybody. Okay. You can't, sometimes you don't have time. All you can do is, Hey, boom, and you're gone. But God uses that. So that's one of the ways that we share this gospel of Jesus Christ, non-relational. That is through print. That is through tracks. That is through media. Some of you are on Facebook. You have all these social ways. You can put something up for somebody to read. Be sure to put God's word there. Because it's living. When you're sleeping and forgot about it, somebody can get a word from God because this book is living. Non-relational, okay? I told the class on Wednesday night, very briefly, please bear with me Wednesday night, folks. We found out there's a ministry down in Kitchen Forge, um, Tennessee, Grace Fellowship International. They have a newsletter. And one day I was reading the newsletter that came in the mail with my name on it. And there was a story about a prisoner who was in that newsletter. He said, I got a piece of a track that was tore up and raggedy. It came from someplace called Berean Bible Church. It was called The Wheel and the Line. He said, sir, I'm writing to tell you, I got this track. This thing turned my world around. I was doing everything under the sun. He said, this thing turned my life around. Some, some church named Berea Bible Church, they had the little red track, the wheel and the line. I want to tell you something. If you haven't got the memo, that track has been in these track racks for 20 years. And as long as this is my watch, they will be here. Amen? 
the printed word of God. Yeah. Turn the man's life around. We don't even know where he got the track. We don't know if he was in prison. We don't know anything. But he got the track. He read the track. And it changed his life. It didn't change his life. God used the word of God in printed form to change his life. Nobody was there, folks. So God's saying, hey, you know what? We got to understand this. There's three methods of sharing the gospel. And one of them is non-relational. You don't have time, but put it in print. Go ahead. You can share those with anybody. You got a short visit. You can always share the gospel. And so you have to remember this because, see, sometimes we put pressure on ourselves. You are not saving anybody. You're not leading anybody to Christ. I am not either. It is the Holy Spirit drawing them, convicting them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Yeah. Amen. I don't know how it happened. I probably told you many, many times. I was only like five years old. 24th Avenue between Franklin and Humboldt. My mom used to teach women in our home. Amen. Yeah. And so she used to teach women in our home. And these were women who had a whole different lifestyle. They were, would not be welcome in some people's churches. Of course, at five, I don't understand nothing, but I was there, I was there, and she would always be teaching and she would share the gospel. And I'm like, Mommy, I want to get saved. You don't understand what we're talking about here. I do understand what we're talking about. No, you don't understand it. We'll talk about, Mom, I understand this. Mommy, I understand this. Okay, explain it to me. Jesus Christ died for my sins. And I, I want to get saved. And I got saved. She wasn't talking to me in the class. She wasn't talking to me. She was talking to the women. But it's the Holy Spirit. He got in my head, even at that age, he got in my head. It was the Holy Spirit. We've got to get this. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about God, the Holy Spirit, drawing people using the word of God. So, hey, let's quit putting tracks down. Let's quit putting doorknob hangers down. Come on, give me an amen. Give me an amen. Let's stop it. You're putting the word of God on somebody's porch. Somebody might go in there and read it, and you're going to get rewarded for what you didn't even know happened. Let's quit putting it down. You're putting the word of God there, and let's quit acting like it's us. It's God the Holy Spirit. It's been God the Holy Spirit all along. This ain't nothing new. Amen? So then we go to what we're going to call um, relational. Okay, you, you got relationship with the people. These are people in your life. Uh, may I dare say it? People in your family. Okay, people that are your friends. You look for opportunities to share the gospel. Okay, but you want to just be relaxed. You might want to wait for them to get a question. But sometimes, you know, we got to make sure we're being led of the Lord. We're filled with the Spirit because some of us got some very logical, sweet sounding excuses for not sharing the gospel. I'm just going to wait till somebody asks me because you're really giving in to your emotions and you're afraid to share the gospel. Here's what gets me. You've seen it. I'm not the only one. We're going to be quiet about it. And then the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons go over there and they talk about it. And the next thing you know, um, Prince and Michael Jackson are now Jehovah Witnesses. Where were all the Christians at? Where are the Christians at? We don't want to offend anybody. Well, the other people aren't caring about what you're doing or if they're offended. Hey, let's come on over here. And we wonder why. I wonder why that happened. Because sometimes God's people are so into relational um, evangelism that they are totally unrelational. They're quiet and they feel good in their conscience because they're really giving in to fear, which is not from God. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. But we rationalize this, you know, and and then we just kind of let it go. Yeah. First Peter 3.15 says you should be ready at any time to give an answer of why you believe what you believe and what you're doing. Amen? And give it with respect and honor to the person. And check this out. That was written initially in the context of suffering. That somebody just beat you half to death. Give them the gospel. Give an answer with respect and reverence for them. And gentleness. Amen? Oh, we sometimes have these relational evangelism. You have a relationship. You, need to, you and I need to do that. You know, we need to do that. And we need to know when to say something, when not. But some of us have locked some stuff down. Oh, you wait for somebody to ask you. Misinterpret the scripture, bending it so we can um, say, uh, just be quiet. Amen? But if God's leading you to say something, say something. 
Amen. Remember, it's not you. It's God using the word of God. OK. And then there's the proclamation. OK. And that is God has got some things in place that you should be hearing the gospel. There should be some gospel somewhere every time you're in church. You know, somebody from a pulpit should be proclaiming, this is how you get saved. Let's get saved, okay? And so I want to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4 in the first five verses. So we're talking about this whole thing of proclamation now, where there's preaching and evangelism. Folks, the guys preaching on the, on the corners, have you ever called them a fool? Repent. They're talking about believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They're downtown. Repent. They're standing on the corner. That's proclaiming. That's evangelizing. In our culture, we got those people labeled as a fool, don't we? Can I get an amen? And if you said it, it's okay. That's why we're having a church, so God can correct us. Amen? They're proclaiming. They are exhorting. There is a place for that. At the very least, you should be getting it in your church. Maybe some of you who want to preach and teach so bad need to get out there and get going instead of sitting around being jealous and envious and all that kind of stuff. There's a whole city, all kinds of corners, where you can go out and use your gifts whenever you want to, too. Amen? Those preachers and teachers aren't the, supposed to be the only ones proclaiming the word. Amen? Are you seeing this? Okay, so we're talking about another method of sharing the gospel, preaching and evangelism. I'm going to read um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. You just listen in. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God, Paul says to Timothy, and of Christ Jesus, ultimate name drop, who is to judge the living and the dead. Oh man, that's serious. And by his appearing and his kingdom. Oh, he is very powerful. Timothy, this is what I'm calling you to do. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine or teaching. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. And will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of the evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Go ahead and preach it. Go ahead and share it. But I'm afraid. Oh, you're in good company. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19 says, Paul said, pray for me that I will be bold, that I won't give in to my fears to share this gospel, yeah. to share the mystery of the gospel, even more technical. Amen. To share the grace of the gospel, to share those things he was given by Christ. He said, pray for me that I won't give in to fear and be quiet because I need to do this. So, hey, you know what? It's all right. You might have some feelings. That's okay. We're going to all have feelings. We all have those times where we're not sure. We might be a little bit afraid. I know that this man here ain't got nothing to do with our Bible, but it sure helps me out. I remember old school John Wayne. Uh huh. He said the difference between a hero and somebody regular is that, hey, they're both afraid, but the hero goes on and saddles up anyway. Amen. We need to be saddling up anyway, regardless of the feelings, folks. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Paul is uh, schooling Timothy to preach and evangelize. Share the message. The message is this good news. That's what gospel means. The message is the gospel to get saved. The message is to live God's type of life now. And the gospel is to live God's type of life throughout eternity. Here's another thing that gets us in trouble. We think all the gospel is, is how people get saved. You have to understand, when you have the rest of the gospel... The gospel is just the beginning, how I get saved, how I go on, how I like this after I'm done. Talk about reigning with Christ, maybe here, that's all a part of the gospel. And then victory in this life now, that's a part of the gospel. All of that is part of the gospel. We're not supposed to be looking like everybody else, living like everybody else, and as powerless as everybody else is. Amen? Amen. Something's wrong with the picture, folks, right? Something's wrong with the picture. So we're talking about proclaiming. We're talking about all of this. Whether it's non-relational, whether it's relational or proclamational, we got to get this one too. If you really want to do, you really want God to, in a sense, have his way. I got to be really careful how I'm saying this. I got I to do this. You got to understand, for some people, you're the only Bible they're ever going to read. You're the only Bible they're ever going to read. And the Bible talks about we all got a fragrance we bring into the room. It's a fragrance of life to some people and a fragrance of death to other people. We've got a fragrance. What is the preacher trying to say? Yes, share the gospel. Get the track out. Do it in relationship. Have it proclaimed. 
But folks, you gotta have a life going with what you're talking about. You gotta have a life that's going along with what you're talking about. We ain't crazy. Talking about victory and don't have it in your own life? Nobody's listening. Talking about Jesus and you doing worse than everybody else? Nobody's listening. Pastors, huh? We're at number two on the list for divorce behind policemen. Wonder why people ain't listening? Christians getting just as many divorces as non-Christians. Wonder why people ain't listening? Just as many addictions. Wonder why people ain't listening? All the secret agent stuff and all the stuff we're doing undercover. Wonder why people ain't listening to me? Listening to us? Gotta have a life to go with this. And believe me, more people are watching you than you would ever imagine. More people are watching you right in this church than you would ever imagine. They watch. Because you watch too, right? God, as he leads us, and we're talking being led, we're talking being led, don't, not going out there getting a notch in your belt and all that. No, we're talking about being led. Uh, we need to share the gospel. We should share the gospel. Non-relationally, hey, I just all I got time for is a track. Relationally, let's sit down and talk. We got relationship. Let me do a little preaching and teaching here. We need to do that. May God grant us to believe him, okay? And stop being afraid and rationalizing. And let's go and call it what it is. Now we got to be careful, but some of us are just flat out lazy. I don't know what else to say. Lazy. You know, all that talk. All that talk. Let's go, let's go, let's do the work. Let's come on, do the work. You know, I, I, ooh, I got, oh, you know, oh, I got, oh, yeah, you know, my kid, oh, my ministry, oh, I can't, hey, let's go, we're going, we're going. Oh, you know, I, I just, maybe next year. And all you're doing is going home to watch the football game. Oh, come on now. I'm in Denver, I'm a Bronco. Oh, it is, it's football. So we close it out today. We're talking about sharing the gospel. May God grant us to believe him. Stop being afraid, stop rationalizing, stop being lazy, and let's share the gospel. It's not on us, it's about God, the Holy Spirit, using the word. So let's focus for a minute on this gospel. I better hurry up here, let's close. This gospel is about grace. It's about Christ, and it's about a response, okay? It's about grace, it's about Christ, and it's about a response. Paul in Acts 20, 24 said that God said, you know, I have a ministry to solemnly test that out, test it out, seriously, get into it, don't play with it. This needs to be vitally important. I have a ministry God gave me to solemnly testify of what, Paul? The grace of God. The gospel of the grace of God. I'm going to tell you about God's grace, he says in Acts. His favor, his sufficiency, his ability to turn your life around. Do you get that? Grace saves you. Grace takes you on. Grace gives you ability. And grace is what turns our lives around. It is all God's grace. 1 Timothy um, 1, 12 through 17, he talks about his life and basically he says this. If God can save me, if God can turn my life around, you got to, you got to know and understand. God, if he can use me, he's using me as an example of his mercy and his grace. Look at my life. If anybody was going the wrong way, it was me. If anybody's life shouldn't have turned around, it was me. That's what Paul says over in 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 through 17. We started out today by reading Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 3, and that was talking about being without God, remember? Well, when you get over there, I mean, we're not getting into it now, but when you get over there, you get into chapter 2 and you follow up verses 4 through 10, it is about being with God because of grace. It's all about grace. God saved you by his grace. Then we get over to like uh, Titus 2, uh, verses 11 through 15. It speaks of God's grace appearing. It's like God's grace came to the planet. God showed up. God sent somebody, his grace. He showed up as a person, Jesus Christ. It's about God's grace. And so we get into this. We're talking about the message of the gospel. It's about God's grace. It's all about God's favor. Nothing you can do. God is doing this. He's reaching out. He's putting this together because of his unmerited favor, because of his love, because of his grace. And later on, he says, everybody's going to praise me because of my amazing grace. Hallelujah. Amen. If we really understand it, it really is something we should be jumping up and down when we sing about God's amazing grace. We don't understand it. We really don't. We take it for granted. We really don't, okay? So the message of the gospel is about God's grace, his unmerited favor again. 
God's grace, the ability to do what he calls you to do. God's grace, to be sufficient that you can get through things because of his grace. God's grace, it all comes out. That's his favor to us. God's grace is all we need. We need it just like we need oxygen. God's grace. So the message of the gospel is about God's grace. The message of the gospel is about a person. It's about Jesus Christ. You know this. It's about what Christ did. He came. He died. He was buried. He rose again for and because of our sins. Okay? And our sins are against a holy and sinless God. Christ's finished work is the only way that we get back to God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by means of me. There is only one way. That is called intolerance in our culture. That is called, oh, hate crime. No, we got to stick with the word of God. This is what you're fighting against. They need to see what God's word says, not the culture. The culture is calling right, wrong, and wrong, right. And they're calling God something he's not. And they're worshiping somebody who's not God. God says, no, there's only one way. It's by Christ. You got to come through Christ or you don't come at all. It's through Christ's finished work. It's through Christ's finished work. So we're talking about the gospel. The gospel is about grace. The gospel is about Christ. The gospel is about what Christ did to solve our sin problem. Okay? Our being separated from God problem. That's what the gospel is all about. The gospel, say this folks, you got to grab a hold of this. The gospel is about being transformed. The gospel is about being transformed. Oh no. The gospel is about being transformed. The gospel is about being transformed. Let that one sink in. If you're thinking all the gospel is, is get saved, we're missing it, folks. It's about having a transformed life. Would you argue, was Paul's life transformed or not? Oh, my goodness. Watch, Manny said it. I didn't. That's the normal Christian life. How far are you away from the normal Christian life? Oh, the pastor's far away. That ain't where God wants me. How far are you away from the normal Christian life? We think that's exceptional. That's for somebody else. That's for somebody that gets paid. That's the normal Christian life. And see, it's all about the gospel. And if you don't think the gospel is transformational, you settling for sardines, you need to be eating steak. Amen? So let's go back to something we're really familiar with. 1 Corinthians chapter um, 15. And we are wrapping up at this time. We're looking at this gospel. This is the chapter that tells us about the gospel. Tells us what it is and all of that. It's very important. I need you to listen today as if you've never heard this before. And here's what I want you to listen to. I need you to listen to how important the gospel is. Listen to how important it is. I need you to listen to what the gospel is. What is the gospel? I need you to listen for who the gospel is about. Who is the gospel about? I need you to listen and see how it transforms a life. How it transforms a life. This person writing is gonna tell you how it transformed his life. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand. By which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles. I'm fighting through this gospel today, dear Jesus. I don't care what that sound does. We're going to hear this gospel. For I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. The gospel, but, I, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me did not prove faith. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so we believe. That is the gospel. I might be a little woo-woo, but every time you're trying to give the gospel, the sound goes out or something, I'll just walk on down the pews like Fred Rice used to do. <laughs> 
We're going to get the gospel. Is the gospel important? Yes, it is. That's how we're saved. What is the gospel? Jesus Christ died, buried, and rose again for our sins. Listen to what the gospel is about. Freedom there. How does it transform a life? Paul said, I was a better apostle than all of them because of the grace of God, the gospel of the grace of God. It transformed my life. The gospel. This is what we want to share. This is what it's all about. The gospel is about grace. The gospel is about Christ. The gospel is a response as we close today. There has to be a response to the gospel. Many people have heard the gospel. I venture to say there's somebody sitting here right now who's heard the gospel in this church a million times and is sitting here not saved. Just hearing the gospel doesn't do it. Just giving mental assent. I believe Jesus Christ died, buried, and rose again. I believe all of that. That was historical. I believe that. No, it has to be personal. You have to respond to it. And it's more than just, I believe it. No, I have to respond to it in faith. Many have heard the gospel. Some even believe the gospel's true. But the gospel demands a personal decision from you. It demands a personal decision. Jesus is the answer. Listen to me. Jesus is the answer. But Jesus demands an answer to the gospel. He demands an answer from you about the gospel. What are you going to do with it? Amen? Some of us have been going to church a long time, folks. And if we die today, we'd be asking that question. Do you think so-and-so was saved? It's sad. It's hard being a preacher like that. You do these funerals, you do a lot of them. And there's folk, you don't know if they're saved or not. I gave a track. I've shared. I've made myself available. But we talk about everything but the gospel. I don't know. You don't know. But are you saved today, folks? Are you, are you saved today? This is, this is, for me, I preached this morning. I preached, I talked to God this morning. I said, God, let's do this. And you can take me to home after this one if you'd like to. We're going to preach this as if we're going to die after we get through today. We're going to give the gospel. If you never see me again. Amen. We're going to give the gospel. Are you sitting here not saved? Why? Why? But you know, God will let you. He will let you. He won't force himself on you. He's a gentleman and he's not desperate. So if you want to be separated from him and do life on your own, he will let you. And if you want to be separated from him for all of eternity and do eternal life on your own, that side, on that side, he will let you do that too. Nobody's going to blame him when they get there. It was your fault. It was your fault. It was my upbringing. I, you know, I didn't get treated right. I, I, you don't know. Look, nobody's going to be standing in front of God blaming him that you never accepted him. Are you saved today? Beyond a shadow of a doubt, are you saved? Jesus is the answer. But Jesus demands an answer about the gospel from you and me. Amen? The answer is I accept it. I believe it. I believe what you did for me. I believe and thank you for what you did. Or the answer is I reject it. I don't believe that mess. Amen? People have gotten married People fake and they believed in Jesus. And then after they got married, you really didn't think I believed in that Jesus stuff, did you? I'm a living witness. I'm a living witness. A lot of people doing a whole lot of things that aren't saved. And trying to get a marriage going, faking it till you get your marriage made up, that's an old hat. That's common. Amen? To obey the gospel is to believe it. Oh, what is this? What does believe mean? Find out what the facts are. And decide, do you believe the facts are true? And if you do, appropriate the facts by faith. Receive them. So we close today. Romans 4 or 5 says this. You, we're talking about this whole gospel. You know, it's a, it's a gospel about grace. It's a gospel about Christ. It is a gospel that has to be responded to. Romans 4 or 5 says this. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Acts 16, 31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. The gospel, another word is the message or the word of the cross. The same thing, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 says this, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the very power of God. The gospel, believe it, receive it, share it, the gospel, share the gospel. By whatever means, God leads you. By whatever means, God leads you. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for our time.
We want to thank you, Lord, for God the Holy Spirit. We give him all the glory and the honor. We thank you for your word. And we are trusting that you spoke today, Father, for your glory and honor, that the gospel was presented, and that we have come to a place where we have to make a decision about it. I pray, Father, that God the Holy Spirit will not allow us to forget what we have learned here today. Father, that he will continue to bring it up. And Father, I pray that you will forgive us, Lord, if, you, if we're talking um, relationship here, understanding the text and all of that. But please forgive us for limiting the gospel to just one little phase, getting saved, when the gospel is everything we'll ever need on this planet and outside of this planet. Help us to really understand who we are in Christ and what we have in him because of the gospel. Yeah. Father, I pray as we kick this thing off, saturate Denver, that you will raise up people from our church um, that you raise up. It's not about guilt. It's not about trying to do something for show and tell. It's about, Lord, being called and led by you to do this work to saturate Denver, Colorado with the gospel. We pray that that will happen, Father, and that we will work together with it. Thank you again for everything. We are trusting you to do above and beyond what we could ever ask or think. Father, please come back to us, Lord, and deal with our excuses and our rationalization. We have people complaining because it's, uh, it's one method, people complaining because it's not another method. We got all these complaints, but nobody's walking up to share the gospel. And so we pray, Father, shouldn't say nobody, but the people complaining. So I just pray that you just really have your way in that area, Lord. Help us to be honest about our stuff and just say what we need to say. I don't want to do it. Father, I just pray if that's where we are, that we'll just say that. Be honest with you and let you change our attitudes. So, Father, thank you again for everything. And we just commit the rest of our time for communion unto you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.